Blessed be the rock that we stand on every day. Hallelujah. Praise God.
I got some mountains in my way. Give me faith every day, every day. Cause only you can move these mountains. It's funny because sometimes when I come in here, I just feel like I know exactly what the Lord wants me to say. And, and tonight, I just really don't have any any clue. <laughs> it's like that sometimes, you know. Sometimes you just, but um, I got a lot of things that, you know, definitely, you know, I could share. I have um, some things that I've been working on for future tense. Not right now, but some things that the Lord has been showing me about following his will, which is pretty good pretty awesome stuff but um what i was gonna talk about tonight and maybe the audience isn't here for that but i always say you never know who's gonna hear this on the replay or whatever so um it's always good and the word doesn't go void we know that but it just was talking about um i guess the idea of sin in general and how when we look at <clears throat> excuse me <clears throat> when we look at man and the problems that man has these problems that are deeply set inside of man in such a way that causes man to act in the way that he does for instance when we look at the original sin of adam and we look at that whole scenario how god put his man in the garden and tended the garden and then would fellowship with him and man had a relationship with god the creator and then he gave him woman and then the whole thing went downhill after that <laughs> That's my interpretation of that scripture. If there's any women listening, it's a joke. But it really isn't because it was Eve that gave in to that stupid serpent. And Adam just kind of had to take it. They, this was his woman that God had made for him. And she decided to listen to the devil. And the whole thing went haywire after that sin came into the picture sin entered into the human race somebody left was that a woman <laughs> <coughs> hey, if we can't have fun in church man we we better hang it up <laughs> right <laughs> so anyway adam sinned and the Bible says, puts the blame back on Adam because Adam was the head of the house. He was the head of the family. So the buck stops with him. And But Satan entered into this thing 
and caused havoc throughout the whole human race and sin entered in and sin spreads like a cancer. It spreads like a disease through the whole human family. And we can see that from the beginning of time, from Cain and Abel, you have the first murder, Cain killing his brother Abel. And we have all through the scripture, the vivid description of sin from Noah's time. The corruption of the earth had gotten so bad that God had to destroy it with a flood and start over. And all the way through the Bible, we see sin destroying mankind. And we see the devastation of that original sin in the Garden of Eden. Now, this brings us to uh, another uh, theological Another theological understanding that we have um, regarding sin, and that is um, that salvation redemption, as we call it, or salvation, which is man's only hope of restoration from that original sin. And the doctrine of soteriology is the study of salvation. And it's a doctrine that if you were to take any of these doctrines that we're teaching on the theology of the Bible, theology for dummies or whatever, as we called it, theology for cavemen, even a caveman could understand this. <laughs> When you break it down in, in a way that people can understand it, I think it makes a lot more sense than trying to, you know, speak over people's heads. And there are theological words and terms and things like that that we don't even use and because they're not in the Bible. They're not words that are in the Bible even. They're just words that people make up to describe something that's in the Bible. And I always wondered, okay, why don't we just use the Bible itself? Why don't we just take the scripture and teach that instead of trying to make it so complicated and that people can't even understand the words that we're using? So I don't like to use those big theological words, even though I do know them. But they don't make any sense to the average person. The average person that's listening to these kinds of messages, they want to know you know, the basics. And so that's why we want to take you through this and, and make it so it's simple and understandable. And basically the doctrine of salvation is, is this, that man fell in the Garden of Eden. In the beginning of creation, when God created man and then woman, they were in perfect state with God. There was no sin. There was no what we call transgression. There was no law. There was none of that yet. You had paradise. You had the Garden of Eden, which was a place of complete oneness with God. But then you have the serpent, which was animated or controlled by Satan. And you have Eve giving in to the serpent's temptation and eating of the forbidden fruit. We don't know what that is. We know what it was. We don't know what kind of fruit it was. Some people think it's an apple. We don't know what the fruit was, but we do know what, what, the, what the command was. Don't eat of that tree. For the day that you do, your eyes would be opened in a way that you will understand what sin is. And you will understand that at that point you have given into sin and you have become sinful, unrighteous. Another word is ungodly. And at that point they became contaminated like a disease with sin and it infected them and it infected everyone after that. So, 
Satan's objective and goal was to do what? To get man to sin, to put man in enmity against God and God in, with em, in enmity against man. But what Satan didn't understand is that it wasn't, God wasn't going to destroy man because his real enemy was Satan. It wasn't man. It wasn't the man that he created. It was the serpent that was in, you know, we could get into the whole story of Satan, how he was a, a rebellious angel, a creature that was created by God that rebelled against God, that tried to assert himself above God, which was ridiculous. And God cast him out of heaven, and we, we could go into all of that. But we understand that Satan embroiled himself in the real enmity it was between God and Satan. Man happened to be in the middle of that. And paid for it, by the way, because of sin destroying all the way through the human family. But in the midst of all of that, failure, the fall of man, sin, Satan setting up his, usurping his authority over man and, and gaining a stronghold over man, which he did. That's why the Bible calls him in one place the God of this world, the world system, the cosmos, the pl not the planet, so to speak, that we think of, but the the well, yeah, but the cosmos, the 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 arena of this world system, and Satan put himself between God and man, and caused failure and sin. Now, sin when it when it when it came in, God said that the day that you eat of the fruit, you shall surely die. That's what He said: you shall surely die. <coughs> And you can find this, and I'm not going to give, give you the, I'm not going to read the scriptures, but you can find this in Genesis. Uh, I would read the first three chapters of Genesis if you really want to get the backstory of all of this. And, uh, you know, I know me and Caleb are here tonight. Caleb, I know you already know this stuff, but somebody may get this on video replay and maybe it'll help them to understand why they're in a sinful state why they're in a sinful place in their life and how this whole thing got started. I think it's a, it's kind of, as a Christian, even good to know this stuff and good to remember this stuff because we understand that even though we're saved and we know what sin is, we need to remember how dangerous sin is. We need to remember that sin is nothing to mess around with. And I think going back and remembering what happened in, the beginning kind of puts the fear of God back in us to make us more aware in our own lives today, how we should avoid at any cost to go after any temptation of the devil. Anything that the serpent says is a lie. Jesus said of him, he is the father of liars. He is a murderer from the beginning. That spirit, that enemy of mankind, the enemy of mankind is Satan. God knew that man was a victim, that Adam was a victim. Even though he treated him as a cul culprit with the sin, he also looked at him as a victim and had compassion on Adam. How do we know this? Because immediately God covered them from their nakedness with the with the blood of animal skins, from the from the killing of animals and the blood that was shed covered their nakedness, just like the blood of Jesus covers our nakedness, our sin today. The blood in the same way of Jesus, the Lamb of God. That blood that was shed of innocent animals was a type and a shadow of redemption in Jesus Christ. 
So God had mercy, even though they sinned. He understood that that Satan was a formidable foe and had tricked them. The very word beguile. Beguile is an old King James English word that was used by the translators. And I love that word beguile. It, it means it means to be hoodwinked, bewitched, beguiled, deceived. Deceived is a good word because tricked. Yeah, somebody wouldn't outrightly in their right mind bamboozle. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, bamboozle. That's a really good word. I like that one. Bamboozled. Conned. There's another one. Conned. But you think about it. If if you if 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 they Eve would have been in her right mind, not in the trickery, under the trickery and spell of the serpent, she would have never given up everything she had with God in that garden. But somehow Satan was able to make that temptation look so good and appealing, right? And that's what he does. That's what he's a master at. It's what he's been doing since the beginning of time. So understand that even though man failed miserably the test, and men have been falling ever since, falling like uh rain falling like whatever all over the place because of satan and sin and trickery and all of that bamboozled deception but if you if you look at every temptation known to man and you put it under a dna microscope test it all traces back to the devil and it all starts with a lie. Because in that temptation, and again, we could spend time on it, but Satan said, you shall not surely die. That's what he said to Eve. You shall not surely die. But God knows that when you eat it, you're going to be just like him. You're going to have as much power as he has. And, and, and what did he do? He appealed to her in a way that would make her sm feel smarter, have power, that part of the nature of, of, of us that wants to be powerful. And, and, you know, this is the same old struggle that you see all the way through history. You see the same struggle to get to the top in, in Wall Street, in Hollywood, in the music business. I got to get to the top. I got to make it to the top. I want that power. I want that, you know, it's pride, right? It's arrogance. It's it's whatever it is that, that he was able, moving on up, <laughs> moving on up to the east side. Yeah, you got it. Whatever it is that he was able to appeal to in Eve is what he's been able to do throughout history. One of the movies that I really, I kind of like it, but I kind of don't like it because it's so true, was a movie, um, it was, um, oh man, now I can't think of the name of it, of course, something Wolf, Wolf something, but it was, I, I can't really remember the name, but it was a, a kind of a movie, it had, um, it was based on an, an old Greek superstition or story of there was a sea creature and she was so beautiful that the sailors couldn't resist her beauty. And so she would transform herself into this beautiful sea creature. And the men would be seduced by her but then when when they got to see what she really looked like she was just just a sea monster you know this horrible creature and she had a son 
and the son was just as evil and wicked as her. And so all these sailors were just, the bones were strewn along the, the ocean from this seduction. And it, it really is a story that has a, a lot of similarities to real life. But this one sea captain was a real righteous man. And he tried to do whatever he could to resist the sea monster. And the sea monster is played by Angelina Jolie. Of course. <laughs> of course, you know. And so, so she's enticing this, you know, trying to entice him. She starts to meet him and, in, in you know, show up on, by the boat and tries to get him to come down to where she lives. And he wouldn't do it. He wouldn't do it. He kept, you know resisting and resisting and resisting until she's finally got angry and sent her son which was this wicked sea creature too and he was a giant and he destroyed their their town and so he was going to meet her to try to come up with some kind of a compromise where you know they could all live together happily but as we know you can't live with sin or satan happily it just doesn't work so over time, you know, he, you know, this is what I don't like about the movie that he compromises too and gives in. And then, you know, it was just, a, but it was just really a picture to me of temptation. Satan transforms himself into an angel of light. But if you really saw the devil and all of his ugliness and you would not want to follow him a second. But he doesn't do that, right? He doesn't come to you as a devil with horns and a tail and all of that. <laughs> he comes to you as an angel of light in your fantasies and, and tries to trick you. And it's the same thing with the siren song. The ships, they couldn't resist her voice and her singing. And so they would listen, and, and, and as they got to the part of the ocean where the siren was, they would listen to her music, and it would drive them into the, into the, into the rocks and crash their ships. It was a beguiling, bamboozlement <laughs> of seduction <laughs> from the sea creature. And so they would bang up against the rocks. That would be it. So this one captain decides he's not going to die any with his men. So when he got to the place of the of the siren, he said to the crew, "I want you to tie me to the mast of the ship. I want you to cover my eyes and my ears." As soon as they got up to where the siren was singing, all the crew was beguiled and bamboozled by this. And they wanted to, you know, go to the siren and, 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 and the captain was tied to the mast. And though he tried, he couldn't get loose. He couldn't get loose until finally they were out of the distance of the sea siren. And the noise stopped. And they let him out off of the mast and after that the sea creature the sea siren song would no longer work because he resisted it it no longer had the power no longer had the 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 and entanglement it no longer had the allurement and that's what we have to do with sin we have to resist it at all cost, we can't listen to the sound of the siren, no matter how good it sounds, no matter how enticing it is. And we should have learned that from Adam and Eve's story. And so we learned that as they sinned and they gave in to the devil, that all through the history of man, man has been giving in to the devil. Man has been compromising. Man, even Israel compromised with Satan over and over and over and over in their history. It seemed hopeless. No one was righteous. No one could stand up to the sea siren 
of the devil. No one. David couldn't do it. Isaiah, Jeremiah, the prophets, even, even some of the greatest prophets, Moses, they all had failure. Until one day, God raised up a man. God raised up someone that was both God and man. Fully God, fully man, the incarnated God, Jesus Christ, God's Son. Amen. And when He came into the world, He was perfect in every way. He didn't listen to the sea siren song. He didn't listen to the devil's temptation. He was 40 days and 40 nights in a wilderness with the devil, continuously to tempting him. And Jesus kept saying, it is written, it is written. And he kept bringing the word of God into the moment. And Satan kept leaving and coming back, leaving and coming back. And finally, when he realized that he couldn't get the Savior, He couldn't get Jesus to sin. He left him. And the Bible said that angels came and ministered to Jesus and fed him. And he was strengthened and he went on with his ministry. And he went on as, a, as the perfect God man. And he destroyed Satan. He destroyed the serpent's bite. The serpent's sting was sin. That's what Satan had. That was his bite. But Jesus was the venom to the serpent's bite. Jesus was the venom. And every person that believes on the serpents in the wilderness that were biting the children of Israel and killing them, that was Satan. And they even made a bronze serpent depicting him but Jesus said in John 3 if I be lifted up on the cross whoever looks upon me and believes shall be saved hallelujah just like in the wilderness when they looked on the brazen serpent on the pole it was a description of Jesus Christ who took on the sin of the world and if you look on Jesus, if you believe on him, you'll be saved, the Bible says. Amen. He is the venom of Satan's bite. Amen. The Bible says he's as a roaring lion. See, the problem with, with that is he's a lion that is toothless. <laughs> because Jesus took all of his teeth out when he rose again from the <laughs> from the dead and so the the lion has no bite he's as a roaring lion not a roaring lion not not he I mean I'm not trying to say that the, the devil doesn't have any you know anybody like <laughs> <laughs> oh that's good we need to play that on every Every church needs to show that one. That's good. Hallelujah. Maybe when we get our, our new chat going, that we can get <laughs> more people involved in these. See, that, that's a really good, uh, I like that. That goes well. But you think about it. You got this lion that comes up and he's roaring. And then he opens his mouth and there's no teeth. What is he going to do? Gum you to death? <laughs> ah, glory to God. It's like in Revelation. It says, 
this is the one that caused the nations to tremble. This, this, this is the devil that caused the nations to tremble. They were like, it was like, it was almost like saying, come on, this toothless lion. This toothless lion, this one that doesn't have any bite, caused the nations to tremble, caused nations to fall. It's all about beguile, right? It's all about that that magic, that spin doctor stuff that he tries to do. He's a liar. He's the greatest con man there ever was. Because what he really is, is a defeated enemy. He's defeated already. You're not waiting for the devil to be cast in the lake of fire. He's already been dethroned by Jesus Christ, right? Well, he was dethroned by God immediately after his rebellion. He's never had any any authority at all other than what God has allowed him to have, which we don't know. That's another doctrine. That's another theological um, truth that somehow God has allowed Satan to be on this earth. He's allowed him to deceive. We don't know why he has, but we know that eventually he's going to be kicked into the lake of fire for eternity, right? Amen. But we know that he's still able to deceive. Resist the devil. Submit to God. Resist the devil. And he will what? Flee from you. Flee. Not turn around and kind of walk away. The word flee means to run. He will run from you. Goliath was a beautiful. Well, not a beautiful. An ugly grotesque, <laughs> an ugly grotesque picture of Satan. What was he doing? He was coming out with mockery. With big swelling words of trying to invoke fear, right? Trying to invoke that fear. And, and he did. He invoked fear in the army of Israel. It took David, who wasn't afraid, because he saw through Goliath. He saw that it was Satan trying to, you know, tear God down. And he even said, you've come to blaspheme my God. But I come to you not with a spear and a sword, but in the name of the Lord of hosts. He understood the battle. Satan disguises himself in politics. He disguises himself in church uh, religious religiosity. He disguises himself in those things so that we don't see his grotesque ugliness that what he really is is an ugly defeated creature that has no power other than what we give him so when you stand you don't stand on your own you're standing in the power of the one lord jesus christ who destroyed him on the cross amen We don't stand here tonight in our own authority. It says in Colossians here in the first chapter. Giving thanks to the Father who has qualified us to be partakers of the inheritance of the saints in the light and has delivered us from the power of darkness and conveyed us in to the kingdom of his son in, in his love, in whom we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins. Looking for another scripture here. Uh, 
Oh, here it is. I love this. Having wiped out the handwriting of requirements that were against us, which was contrary to us, he has taken it out of the way, having nailed it to the cross, having disarmed the principalities and powers of darkness. He made a public spectacle of them triumphing over them. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. He made a spectacle of triumphing over Satan, over all the demonic spirits of hell. And he disarmed them. See, this is like, imagine that you're, you know, coming back from World War II and all the Germans are there and you see the American can army just taking the tanks and destroying them grabbing their their rifles and and just taking all of them away and making them a spectacle parading over them this is what Christ Jesus did amen this is what he did he disarmed listen to what it says The handwritings that were against us. The things that were written by Satan, the accuser of the brethren, the things that he wrote down against you. Jesus Christ nailed that ordinance to the cross. He took that accusation. He said, here, nailed it to me. It was nailed to my flesh. You are no longer accountable for that sin because I took that sin on myself on the cross. We are redeemed. That's redemption. But then when he rose again from the dead, he disarmed principalities and powers he disarmed satan now what was satan's greatest weapon against you and me guilt accusations and lies the guilt accusation and lies when we get saved we see ourselves in the eyes of God, a holy God, as a sinner. We see our sins, and that's a gulf between us and God. That's a cavern. But what we also see is we see the cross. We see the blood of Jesus. We see the way out. We see the door of hope. That we can be forgiven. And when we ask Jesus into our life, we're forgiven, we're redeemed, we're set free. And we have that new life that he gives us. But that's different. Conviction leads us to Jesus. Condemnation leads us to the devil. That's the difference. Conviction will always lead you to Jesus and forgiveness. But condemnation and guilt will lead you into Satan's trap. And people live, even as Christians, imprisoned in guilt their whole life because they listen to the ordinances of the devil, the handwritings of Satan, the accusations of and Jesus said, I've nailed them to the cross. Hallelujah. I've nailed them to the cross. That means I don't have to carry those things. I don't have to carry them. Imagine if Paul the apostle carried all of his guilt. He'd have never lasted a day in the ministry. We don't understand the power of these lies, of what the devil does to manipulate, to trick, to deceive, to bamboozle. <laughs> That's a new word. <laughs> uh, to try to entrap us. You know, the old thing was, you know, you sell your soul to the devil for fame or 
whatever. And it's kind of a metaphor, you know, there's been tons of shows that people have done this and And so we we get caught up in 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 that and and we we think about that and and people, you know, you can't really sell your soul to the devil, but you can sell your soul if you listen for one second to the devil's lies. And the Bible says he destroyed not only Satan, but his demonic spirits. But yet, he writes in Colossians that these things have been disarmed. But yet in Ephesians 6, he tells us to put on the whole armor of God to watch out against these principalities and powers, right? So he's not contradicting himself, but what he's saying is, on the one hand, Satan's destroyed. But on the other hand, you still have to watch out because he's still cunning and crafty. He still has the ability to trick and deceive. Jesus said in Matthew 24 that even the elect could be deceived. If these days were not shortened, these days of deception, these days of apostasy, that Paul said would come upon the church. Where <clears throat> love would grow cold, the Bible said. Men would be lovers of self, boastful, prideful, arrogant. We're living in that day. We're living in that apostasy that Jesus and Paul talked about. We're living in that day. But we're also living in a time of revival. And so let's just close with that and say the doctrine of sociology is a doctrine of salvation. And salvation only comes through this one that was worthy. The only one in, in human history that licked, whipped, and destroyed the devil at every game that he played, every chess game, every mental game that he played against the Son of God, he lost. Not that there was ever a chance that Jesus was going to lose, but regardless of that, he came as a man in the flesh to destroy the curse of what happened in the Garden of Eden. To destroy that curse of sin, that hold that reigned over mankind. No wonder angels sang over his birth. No wonder angels rejoiced over his coming. Because they knew that sinners were now going to be made saints. Hallelujah. That those that were lost in, in, in this world, those that had no hope, those that were destroyed by sin would be able to be redeemed by the blood of the Lamb of God. Hallelujah. John the Baptist said it right. Behold the Lamb of God that takes the sin out of the world. Behold the Lamb of God. The lamb, a lamb, a creature so fragile, so filled with frailty. Not a lion, a lamb, a meek and lowly lamb would be our point of deliverance. A lamb from the foundations of the world, from the beginning, from before Adam and Eve sinned, God had a lamb. God had a lamb ready to go who would redeem the world from sin, who would destroy the devil. That's salvation. That's redemption. 
everything that went with sins, twisted disease and 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 twisted um whatever you I can't think of the word I'm looking for, but it's it's twisted, all right. But the twistedness of sin, what went with that? Sickness and disease, right? Hurt and pain and death. All of the fruit that came from sin. Jesus redeemed us from and destroyed it with his own body on the cross. Hallelujah. That's salvation. By his stripes, we are healed. Hallelujah. Everything that he did, everything that his blood performed is still available today. That whosoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. That nothing can hold you back from being saved. Nothing can stop you from coming to Jesus. Because the blood made the way. The blood of the cross. The blood of his son. That whosoever will let him come. Means that we can come to Jesus. And we can be saved. We can be redeemed. We can be redeemed from sin, sickness, disease, and everything else. And one day when we get to heaven, we have a glorified body with no pain, no more. We, there'll be no more pain. There'll be no more crying. There'll be no more sorrow. There'll be no more death. Because God has made a way. Amen? God has made a way. And when we take the cup, and we should take the cup of communion, and we drink that cup. It's the blood of the covenant, isn't it? It's the blood of his covenant that he made with us. But it's a signification to remember his death until he comes. To remember what he did. The broken body. He was made frail. He was made weak. Now, that doesn't make any sense to the world. Didn't make any sense to the Jews. That's why they didn't receive him as Messiah. Because they don't understand it. It confounds them. But it confounded the devil too. Because the world only thinks in a certain way. Only a mighty man could save a weak man. If a man is broken. If a man is weakened. How could he save anybody? Because they don't understand the profound cross of Jesus Christ. The paradox in order to in order to save the world he had to be broken. This bread is my body, which is broken for you, which is broken for you. Isaiah 53, he shall suffer he was bruised for our iniquities the chastisement of our peace was upon him and by his stripes a broken lamb a broken savior not that he was broken in the sense that his bones were broken because he, the bible says that his bones could not be broken they had to be whole and they weren't jesus was already dead when they came to examine him on the cross, they didn't break his bones, which was prophetic. Prophetic. But he was broken in his spirit. He was broken and poured out in his life. And the Bible says that was only the beginning. Because God said, I won't leave your soul in the grave. I won't leave your soul in the grave. And God raised him from the dead. I said God raised him from the dead. We said that so many times, didn't we? But what does that mean? It means that because he was raised from the dead, he's the perfect high priest to go between us and the Father. And the Bible said he ever lives to make intercession for us. He's a go-between. He's the mediating lamb. He's the lamb on the throne, the Bible said.
He's not weak anymore. He was weakened. But when God raised him from the dead, all of the power of heaven and earth was residing on and in Jesus. And all of the work of redemption from Eden to Calvary, from Eden to Calvary, was sufficed in the person and body of Jesus Christ. Every sin, everything that man did was destroyed. The yoke was destroyed by Jesus Christ. When he rose from the dead, he triumphed over that. He brought his blood before the Father as an acceptance. And God accepted the blood of his Son for the sins of the world. And Satan lost. Every single trick, every single deception, every single thing that he's ever tried against mankind was destroyed in the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Everything was destroyed. Satan had no more weapons to go through. Now, you might say, well, then why are, am I still being tempted? <laughs> right? If Satan's destroyed, and like you say, because you're still living in a body, you're not in heaven yet. You still feel temptation because you're still in a sinful body. Your body hasn't been redeemed yet. One day it will be. God didn't say temptation would end, but he did say the power to live and overcome was granted through Jesus Christ. So salvation, as we like to call it, Avery, how you doing? How you been? It's been a while since I've, I've heard from you. How you been? Are you out of school for the summer? All right. Are you looking forward to your summer? I hope everybody where they live, they don't have to wear a mask anymore. <laughs> uh, get those masks on. Throw them off. Your first ever job. Wow. What are you going to be doing? A product assistant. Wow. That's cool. What kind of a documentary is it? <laughs> it's a long story. Okay. Well, let me close this message out. Um, just in case anybody is listening after this. So salvation, I want to close with this because I want, I want to make it clear that salvation is just a word that means what it sounds like. If you salvage something, we all know what that means. It means you're saving it from being destroyed. And that's literally what Jesus did. He saved us from being destroyed by the devil, by hell by everything that was against us. But Jesus salvaged us. And that's salvation in its truest form.